as time has shown, by today's standards, most vanilla raid bosses are actually easier than your mom, but by two Bruh. Okay. 2004 <laughs> to 2007 standards, where everybody sucked as much as your mom, it wasn't so simple. Okay, dude. Okay, the last boss he's gonna mention. Let's go through them. Night. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead with Visitus. Whoa. Huh? Oh, shit. <laughs> this, yeah, again, talk about difficulty. Let's see. Top 10 hardest raid bosses in Vanilla WoW. I did it myself. I raided myself from Vanilla, TBC, and Wrath. But uh, let's uh, have a look at what he has to say about all this. This year, in November, World of Warcraft will have reached its 20 year anniversary. I'm assuming and over the course of Cthulhu 10 expansions, hundreds of different raid bosses have come and gone, leaving behind the legendary tales of triumph, drama, and failure. And today, we're going to pay tribute to the base game that started it all, Vanilla, and counting down the top 10 most difficult raid bosses. So, difficulty will be determined in the context of their release date. As time okay. has shown, by today's standards, most vanilla raid bosses are actually easier than your mom, but by two Bruh. Okay. 2004 to 2007 <laughs> standards, where everybody sucked as much as your mom, it wasn't so simple. Okay, dude. <laughs> Anyways, coming in at You can hear the smirk in his fucking voice. It would be so fucking fun if he just, like, kept it super ice cold. Um... Okay, this will be a little bit different then, because back then maybe some bosses were like, pa like, were just brought out really poorly, and then they got patched. But he's probably mentioning it from a state of like when it was actually in like a, a non-test thing, and then they fix it. You know. At number ten, we have the final boss of the first big raid in vanilla, the Molten Core, which yeah. is Ragnaros, the Fire Lord. Gotta have the fire so, assistance. To set the stage here. We need to talk about raiding during these early years of the MMO. Not just World of Warcraft, but genre-wide, it was still in its infancy. MMOs, being incredibly niche before World of Warcraft's release, focused more on retaining players in the early game, trying to avoid getting them to quit within their first day, or even the first 10 minutes. The oh, primary yeah. goal was to get them hooked, and then get them to stay with endgame activities, but as it stood, they were still struggling with the former, and as a result, most of their efforts would be focused on that early game and leaving the raid bosses neglected by comparison. Today, it's a fucking head swirl. Oh, there, it's just completely stale. It's common and expected that these bosses are unique, holding a plethora this does not of look complex like well. raid mechanics that require teamwork to overcome. But back then, it was quite common that these badass ultimate raid bosses were simply upscaled, recolored models of normal enemies. They're given a special name, a buff to damage and health, and some special loot to drop. By the time World of Warcraft came out, it was even rare to have instance raids at that point. Mm -hmm. So the first large raid, the Molten Core, would hold many such fights, such as the Mind Control Salamander, the Reign of Fire Salamander, and the Group Salamander, and the group salamander too. What's up with all the weapons? At most, they would have one or two mechanics, so when players cleared through them and reached Ragnaros, you would be quite a roadblock at the time. Other than Anixia, this was one of the first fights to have different phases, where he would begin up top, requiring at least one melee target, or else he would blow up the raid with magic. And combining this with the fact that he would periodically knock back all melee targets added a tricky timing element where tanks had to swap threat and melee had to periodically fall back to avoid it. Yeah. Ranged would have to spread out to avoid AoE knockbacks. And Dude, when the f like in 2019, when the fires came out in the beginning, we f like we fucking panicked. It's like the boss was like kind of yikes enough, and then all of a sudden, what the fuck adds also? <laughs> but I mean, yeah, it, it easily got to become like a cakewalk thing. Um, but yeah, and, and, and like from personal experience, like I've back then, I I, I mean, I played Vanilla WoW, but I never raided. I, I didn't hit max level from until TBC, I believe. So all of this was completely new to me. But uh, you know. You stem from like background of playing retail and 
and stuff like that. So mechanics weren't. I mean, it's not like we. T- Let's just put it like that. And after some time, he would transition into the submerged phase, where he hides and summons mini cells to fight you off, which AOE mana drain and requires tanks to gather them up and keep them away from the caster so they could be killed from ranged. And to top all of this off, this was the first resist fight where raiders had to farm and craft yep. a variety of fire resist equipables and consumes in order to survive. Putting you looked horrible. A monetary stress on them as well. Again, by today's standards, pretty trivial. But at the time when these were the first real raids that the genre had seen, this was a definite step above, and it earns the Fire Lord the number 10 spot on our list today. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, it's vanilla well, only, so... Fire Marsh should be in here. Racing Gore, okay. Yeah, the egg's Next, exploding. <laughs> we have the Razor Gore, the Untamed. It's July 12th, 2005, and the Blackwing Lair Raid has just released, and anybody who was playing during this time will remember this absolute brick wall of a boss. This the first was a well. This was a guild killer. The fight worked as follows. There's a room filled with a bunch of eggs and a giant dragonkin named Razorgore who essentially makes eye contact with you. Yeah, Bevan, this guy slaps your girlfriend's ass. What do you do? And then slaps your imaginary <laughs> girlfriend's ass. This fight revolves around mind control and the only way to control him is by clicking an orb. And aside from the ass slapping, he has a few other abilities. He has an AoE fireball, a sleep that works on Dragonkin, and most importantly, an ability that destroys an egg. A player must. It is very unique that you actually control the boss that you're supposed to kill. To then, after all the eggs are done, it's a very like. If you think about it, it's a pretty cool fight, like. You kill orcs that are like mind controlling the boss, and then you take over the mind control, so you control the boss, you destroy the boss's eggs, and then he gets unleashed and f- like tries to fuck you up. That's a very cool sort of storyline for a boss, to be honest. Just mind control him and go about the room, destroying one egg at a time while sleeping high health dragonkin until every single egg is destroyed, at which point phase two starts where he must be tanked like a conventional boss. To the, the wall, to problem, the wall. Each corner of this room is continuously spawning orcs and dragonkin that try to kill the players or Razor Gore. And if Razor Gore dies before all of his eggs are gone, he kills the entire raid. So you need one player to control him and a backup to take over in case they get interrupted while the raid splits up into four corners and killing ads as they spawn and leaving the dragonkin for warriors and hunters to kite as they had too much health to kill without getting overwhelmed. Wait a second. I don't recall that the NPCs spawn, if you're mind controlling race war, that the NPCs try to kill the boss? Might have been a bug in that case, right? Because that's not supposed to happen. I remember vividly that, like, you took the ads by yourself. Never attacked Racing did it? If the players are successful at this, be wrong. phase two begins, where it's mostly a tank and spank, aside from him randomly conflagrating people, which drops aggro, making it a two tank fight, and requiring the range to split away from the melee. So this was a very hectic and complex fight at the time, especially compared to the overall simple molten core. And that veil was also essentially like filtered out the unworthy. Today, raids are structured such that they ramp up in difficulty, giving a couple of freebies to start things off. But uh, yeah. in 2005, they weren't messing around. Many guilds were demotivated to get brick walled and only seeing one room of this new shiny raid, and they liquidated as a result. Today, as time has shown, it's not too bad, but again, back then, this was a guild killer, and it earns the number 9 spot on our list. The number 1, the first boss in the ring, huh? It should be more in BVL, honestly. Okay. Cthulhu? But no, no, this shouldn't be number 10. No, this should be number 1, I mean. On number eight? Coming really? Number eight, we take a visit to Vanilla's third major raid, the Temple of Ankiraj, specifically the second to last non optional boss, the Twin Emperors. 
This is a two boss fight. All right. Vecklor and Vecklanesh. One is a caster who is only vulnerable to magic attacks, and the other melee, who is only vulnerable to physical attacks. And they start on opposite ends of the room, which is by design because the big trick with this fight is that if they are too close to each other, they heal. They must be separated from the initial pull to the end of the fight, and to make matters worse, they periodically switch places, dropping all aggro when they do, meaning that a total of four tanks were required, one physical and one caster tank for each side. The thing is, I remember, like, if you think back at, like, Classic WoW, the sort of mechanics that were implemented, like, you need to specifically have a Warlock tank that had specific gear, was specifically, ta like, specced, um, and it was just, if you didn't know about it, then how the hell would you figure it out, you know? So, like, f the figuring out part, at such an early stage of MMORPG, like World of Warcraft, very challenging, honestly. Um, it's very impressive, to be honest, that they come up with all these different mechanics. Like, yes, it is classic, and yes, it is easy, but... Back at the like at the time, the, like it was complex fights, dude. Additionally, they will cast periodic AOE blizzards that you have to avoid, and the room is also filled with scarabs, which will randomly be selected to grow in size and explode if they aren't killed in time, damaging everybody within. Yeah, the don't AOE with this shit. So the physical tanking was tricky enough, but casting was another story, and there were a few strategies for it. Typically, a warlock builds for it. Making a resist and stamina. Oh, you could do it otherwise. Build otherwise, spamming other. You could do it like besides warlock or pain, which generates more threat. My guild back then just had a warrior continuously spam battle shout to get buff aggro. Believe it or not, I don't know. Maybe that was our bad, but we did kill them eventually using that method. How would you keep the threat though? And I've also heard that horde use shaman sometimes because they're overpowered. But besides the actual mechanics. What made them so difficult was their placement in the raid. Ankaraj is giant, and every time you died, you started all the way back at the beginning. That's why the trash drops those 100% speed mounts that are only usable within the raid. Yeah, but the whole gauntlet thing died when uh, Fancris died, I believe. Or did it not? Maybe it didn't. Actually, no, it didn't. It actually didn't. Because I remember when we cleared it, we needed to run back, and there was just a bunch of... Uh, yeah, yeah. And you could unlock a teleport, but that was only after you kill the Emperors, making them the worst corpse run in the game, maybe even to this day still. And to make matters worse is that right before their room, they also had those infamous Anubisath giants patrolling. Yeah, them, yeah, which would there was tactics respawn part of these. until the Emperors were defeated, and it was quite fast too. These things had random abilities such as a meteor or an AoE disease plague, among others, or a combination of them. So you couldn't even really develop a strategy around them. And between yeah, that then, and maybe. the lengthy run back, it was very common to spend entire raid nights on this trash, and then only getting a few attempts at the Emperors themselves. I remember when we killed them after months of trying. It was a nerdgasm that would have put Joe to shame. So, the Twin Emperors come in at number 8 on our list. Fair enough. Yeah, it should be higher up though. Not, no, not Cthulhu yet. Next, if one were to guess which boss stood the longest, I think most would say the final boss, Cthulhu, which is close, but in close. The longest standing boss in the raid was actually the optional burrowing sandworm. What? Oro. He's one of three optional bosses within the raid, the others being the royal tree oh, and dude, this the Sidus. And this worm is only pullable after the aforementioned Twin Emperor's boss. So the big worry with Oro is his Sand Blast ability, which is a cone breath that will nuke the raid if they stand in it. He is also one of the hardest hitting bosses in the game, so usually what would kill people is the tank gets bursted down and he turns to the raid and Sand Blasts them, resulting in a wipe. He also has the sweep ability which knocks back and requires a warrior or druid to immediately Charge intercept back, yeah. back in. He will periodically quake areas of the room, 
which the raid needs to avoid, and he'll also submerge and summon scarabs, which need to be killed before they overwhelm the raid. And he'll also berserk at 20%, increasing his damage and attack speed even further. And what made him tough wasn't necessarily complexity as much as it was just brute force damage. What my uh -huh. guild did was we rotated warriors with shield wall because the damage was just so bursty. Yeah, healers and tanks especially had to be on their game to take down this longest standing AQ-40 boss. That's kind of shocking. Really? Because... I mean, back in 2019, I, it kind of feels weird saying back in 2019 when it feels like yesterday, you know? Um, but back in 2019, this boss was basically, I mean, the first attempt was like a little bit challenging. But after that, it was like, okay, did anyone need the Don Julio healing hat? And maybe a, <coughs> maybe a hunter need like the crossbow or something sorry about that um but other than that you skipped it there was maybe like a trinket or oros intact something i don't remember but usually you kind of even skip this patchwork okay let me guess let me guess I'll pause before I say it. In Vanilla World of Warcraft, there is an add-on called Healbot, and most know this add-on. Oh, okay, gave it away there. Yeah, it's Lothab. Add-on today to be handy for keybinding, but back in its original inception, it worked a little bit differently. It would look at a target player's health, a caster's mana, their plus healing stat, and based off of all of this information, automatically select the most mana-efficient, appropriately ranked healing spell. It was so useful that it was considered by many to be mandatory by high-end raiders at the time due to how powerful it was. And Blizzard being aware of this, sought to break this add-on in one of the fights in Vanilla's final raid tier, Maxramus, with the final boss of the yeah, Plague Wing, 100%. Lotheb. 100%. So aside from his physical attacks, there are two major sources of damage on this fight. A Poison Aura, which deals periodic nature damage to melee, and Inevitable Doom, dealing heavy shadow damage after 10 seconds to everybody, every 30 seconds, about 2 minutes into the fight. But most important is a debuff called Corrupted Mind, which only allows the use of one healing spell every 60 seconds, which severely limits the raid's ability to heal only to tanks, with the rest of the raid being left to fend for themselves with consumables and bandages. And yeah, you had like... Um... 11 healers maybe sometimes depending on and additionally to actually help the players these spores will spot around the room which when killed give the five nearest players a debuff <clears throat> that increases crit chance and prevents threat generation for 90 seconds so the raid would have to coordinate and rotate who gets the buffs throughout the fight again when he talks about these bosses i am over and over again surprised and also amazed at the sort of creativity of all these bosses, honestly. It's, it's, it, I, I, even though, I mean, you need to think back then, you know what I mean? Some of you watching this weren't even bored then, you know what I mean? If that's the point. Um, it's, uh, I don't know. It, 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 back then, yeah. And the, the, I think that the, the most challenging bosses, like even in 2019, people struggle with some bosses. And those are the sort of bosses you sort of go like, mm, yeah, okay, these. Lothab's definitely on the list, 100%. So it's essentially one giant DPS race, and it would also end up being one of the most expensive fights in the game, requiring yeah, protection, protection potions for each attempt. And if you haven't figured it out yet, Lothab is an anagram for heal bot. This boss was meant to challenge the player's reliance on these powerful add-ons and take them out of their comfort zone and require them to have a very precise rotation on healing. Just to explain it, you had basically 11 casts of heals per minute if you had 11 healers. And if you didn't, then you would have 10 or how many healers you would have. Uh, and so they could... Toss a heal and then get a one minute debuff. Then someone else is jump in and then toss another heal and keep the tank alive. And the tank needs to do its most to just utilize cooldowns and 
trinkets and all that kind of jazz to sort of survive everything um and then the dpsers if you're you, you're not don't beg for heal fucking get first aid you know what i mean oh shit <laughs> this yeah again talk about difficulty talk about like the amount of strategy We're going to switch on over to the final boss of the death knight wing the four horsemen this fight consists of four bosses who periodically apply a unique stacking debuff to everybody within 40 yards and at a certain point it becomes unhealable so the strategy to beat them is to split oh, them up frozen room? into the four corners of this very large room and for the entire raid tanks healers and dps to play merry-go-round moving from one boss to another before their stacks get too high and whittling them down little by little. It's a fight that requires a lot of coordination and execution, and it's extremely unforgiving for mistakes, as one screw up would wipe the entire raid, yep. especially if a tank dies or they mess up their rotation. When you have world buffs on, aside from the actual don't mechanics, part of the difficulty from this was just composition. This fight required eight tanks, and with warriors generally being the only effective tanking class in vanilla. It made recruitment a nightmare, and guilds would constantly poach from other guilds, which would cause a lot of drama. I yeah. think today people have figured out how to do it with five tanks, which requires perfect execution and no resistant taunts, which also requires a trinket farm in Zulkarub. But again, speaking in 2006 standards, we tanks. didn't know any of this crap. We were just a bunch of slack jaw daffodils, and no, two very tanks. few guilds ended up or playing three. this final boss of the yeah. Death Knight Wing. I mean, the modern version of this is just you stack them, right? You stack them. So, bottom corners, top corners, put two here, put two there. No, sorry, I believe you even put three bosses there and then one there. Yeah. And then you just fucking you the, slash everything down there and then you switch, slash, and then if all of these are not dead, you go back again and slash down the those and then you just wait your turn to kill the, the other one. Minimax, you know? Saffron, yeah, frost resistance. Constant ticking of damage. Next, it's a healing fight. The second for to sure. last boss, Saffron, who is only unlocked after clearing all four of the wings in Max Ramus. This is the frost resist fight of the raid, which that itself warrants a spot on this list. This fight was fucking expensive, requiring high end frost resist gear, absorption potions, and a lot of time to farm the gold to get all of it. Or you could yeah. just swipe your credit card, I suppose. But, of course, all of this made you... Even back then, you could. You could also... It's funny. You could also tell if you were in a paladin group because you had a frost resistance. You could, like, quickly see the ticks. Just not doing as much as if you were in a group of, like, a whole, like a priest or something. But just like, tick, tick, tick. And then without the frost resistance, it's like, duk, duk, duk. <laughs> you hit, like, a wet noodle, which just prolonged the fight. The main worry is that there's this constant frost aura that deals damage to the raid throughout the fight, yeah. which is the primary reason why you need the resistance. It's a dragon fight, meaning you have to stay away from the head and tail to avoid unnecessary tail swipes and breaths. And the ranged were to spread out to minimize the damage from AoE blizzards moving about the raid, while melee had to move together to avoid them, and mages and druids would need to decurse a life drain immediately as it would damage a player and heal Saffron. And her other phase was the air phase, where she takes off into the sky and hits five random players with an ice block. Can we just talk about the mage tier? The gear looked fucking cool back then as well. Some of it cooler than nowadays. The mage set was fucking amazing, dude. Which is crucial because she follows this up with an insta-kill AoE that can only be avoided if you hide behind an ice block player. And the tough thing with this was that it was random, and it's also an AoE, so you needed to keep spread out throughout this very large room. So what would happen is that she could simply put all of the ice blocks on one side, which would completely screw over the other side as they can't reach it in time. And the ice blocks themselves would deal a lot of damage to the player afflicted, so they would need to be topped off, because if they died, it would disappear. Oh, they would be one the shot. The they would get one the shot. AOE. It's a very healing intensive fight, 
and like the other resist fight, I think there's some added difficulty economy-wise having to farm for consumables and frost gear and everything. Yeah, true. Soldiers of the cold really? Obey the call of Kel'Thuzad. Next, we have Kel'Thuzad, and the numbers speak for themselves here. Okay. Extremis 40 Man, at its original release, was tough. Even making it to this boss was a feat of its own, one that just 1% of the rating population could say they vanquished. Yeah, but that's true. What awaited them was the grand finale, and rightfully so. Because the reason also uh, was that it was the last boss out of the expansion. So a lot of people just kind of like, eh, whatever, just, just, just wait out TBC. But like, ah, uh, yeah, I can, yeah. Going into I like uh, I see see Nexramus, Nexramus. Um, we uh, it was one of those things that like back then people didn't even kill this boss. I mean, but not but nowadays it's obviously very different. This was a three phase fight, arguably the most complex in all of vanilla. It started off with an undead gauntlet. Surrounding the room are these large groups of undead mobs, and Kilthasad will start the fight invincible while the undead slowly rush at you. There are three different types you have to worry about. By the way, that was my notification. Sorry, it wasn't yours. Maybe it was even. Maybe hey, double. Abominations, which are the trickiest because they have high health. They cleave, so they, they cleave, have to be yeah. faced away. And they also inflict a healing debuff, meaning that you have to either tank swap or kill them extremely fast before the next one arrives so you don't get overwhelmed. There are skeletons which have lower health, but if they reach the raid, they explode for AoE damage. Yes, yeah, some so I don't know why, but some people just decided to death grip these guys in I mean, back in Wrath. And in Nax, I mean, yeah, it would be pretty bad if it got into the group. Reach the center and the raid which will wipe shouldn't happen, if they obviously. fell at this. And lastly are the banshees, which must also be killed before they reach the center, as they will knock the raid around and deal AoE damage. This phase persists until all mobs are killed. And it's a big DPS check, as it's quite easy to get overwhelmed. But it's if a you're successful, timer, the then fight moves forward with phase forced. two, where you realize it's another mm -hmm. resist fight, as he has this frostbolt volley, which hits the rate every 15 seconds, dealing heavy frost damage and slowing everyone. Positioning in this fight is crucial, as every 30 seconds he will ice block a random oh, raid member for five seconds, as well. which will spread and stun them and deal 104% of their total health over five seconds. So this is something that had to be minimized as much as possible. He will also continuously cast a single target Frostbolt on the tank, which must be interrupted. It's just a two second cast, so you had to be quick, and he can cast it much faster than a kick or a pummel cooldown, which meant that a rotation was required, and combined with the positioning requirement, spacing for melee was incredibly tight. He also spawns the Shadow Fishers on the ground, which will instantly kill anyone standing in it, three seconds and then after they spawn, the mana thing. and he'll also detonate mana, yeah. which drains a caster's mana pool and deal AoE arcane damage to anyone nearby, which further reinforces the need to spread out. He will also periodically mind control his main target, wiping threat, which makes two tanks minimum a requirement, and the mind controlled must also be crowd controlled. Once he reaches 40% health, phase three begins where he'll spawn five guardians of ice crown. These are undead, so they can be shackled, but only three at a time. If a fourth is shackled, he'll break them all free, which means coordination is required, and you'll also need two more tanks to pick up the loose adds. They deal heavy damage, and it increases the longer they're alive, and the healers at this point are already stressed, which means it's preferable to kite them, which is also tricky because you still need to be spread out to avoid spreading the detonations and ice blocks. And all of this is happening all at once. It is definitely one of the most complex fights in vanilla, if not the most complex. As mentioned, only 1% of the guilds ever defeated him in original vanilla, so he's certainly worthy of the title of the final boss of the game. So I made spreadsheets of every single boss. The ones that took the most time. Saffron is, uh, sorry, Kel'Thuzad is definitely on that list. It took a lot of coordination and just splitting out the group it, it, like it took time. Um, Lothab also for horsemen, yes. Um, 
Other than that, I'm not sure. So I can also understand it from like, when you look at it from a technical perspective of what needs to be synced, I can definitely see it being like difficult. Um, and you need to have a mindset of back then, right? Not now. Everything is facial. You can't think of it like that, obviously. Um, so yeah, definitely. I, I can see the, 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 the managing of a lot of people needing to do something like just the correct thing all the time. Yeah, I can see that being very difficult. And certainly worthy of a number three spot on our list. There you go. There you go. Oh, what's the hardest one? And next, we of course can't skip over Cthulhu himself, specifically before he was nerfed. On that note, this is our first boss on the list that went unkilled. You may have heard that he was famously deemed to be mathematically impossible. A shaman named Gurgthok from the high end raiding guild, Elitist Jerks, calculated the damage throughout the raid, assumed the best gear available in perfect play, and he concluded that they would always run out of mana before they could kill him. Incidentally, this player was Ian Hazakostas, who later ended up being the game director for World of Warcraft. And there's a bit more. Really? He. Wait, what? Out of mana before they could kill him. Incidentally, this player was Ian Hazakostas, who later ended up being the game director for World of Warcraft. Oh! And there's a bit more interesting lore behind this one before we get into the actual fight. Wow! Before the what nerf, the fuck? The nerd okay. rage reached this boiling point of sorts. There's a player named She of the High End Raiding Guild, Death and Taxes, who posted a profanity laced tirade demanding for the fight to be fixed and calling the developers incompetent for releasing it in such a state and wasting people's time and threatening that his guild are going to quit and play professional solitaire. This was actually a parody post of a similar one made by Alex Afrasiabi, otherwise known as Fear from Fires of Heaven, which was a high end raiding guild from EverQuest. When the Planes of Time raid was released, he made the same post, threatening that he and his guild would leave EverQuest if they didn't fix it. And now that he was working at Blizzard, she was essentially mocking him as Blizzard had now made the same mistake with their own raid. This sparked a 1 a.m. IRC nerd <laughs> oh. fight with Afrasiabi saying, just because they can't beat the boss doesn't mean he's broken and that she has Down syndrome. But I digress. Cthulhu was split up into two primary phases, <laughs> the eyeball what the fuck? and the hentai tentacle phases. Even pulling him was a hurdle that most struggled with at first, as I have no idea what you're talking about. One of his most major mechanics was his eye beam, which targeted a random player on his aggro table, and it chained to another player if they were close enough, doubling in damage. Yep. So because of this, the raid had to remain spread out at all times, as it would eventually one-shot if it jumped enough times, and to pull him. The raid has to let the tank run in and give him a lot of room to work with. Or, if you're playing hardcore mode, you can intentionally troll and follow him in and permanently wipe everybody's characters. Again, do not run in with me. Wait! Oh my fucking god! Yeah, I haven't been a victim of this at all. Not at all. It's the, the, the fucking audacity to make a boss fight where, like, if you even enter the room incorrectly, you all fucking die. Like, what the fuck? Everyone. Imagine, like, the first raiders going into this. Going like, okay, all right, take positions. And then just, wait, what? The fuck happened? Is it bugged? No. It's, it's exactly what it's supposed to do. But uh, you just gotta have to figure it out. What? Oh, oh fuck. Throughout the fight. Tentacles oh will spawn God. and attack the raid, which need to be killed immediately before they overwhelm them. You have the eyeball tentacles, which have the lowest health and inflict mind flay on a random member. And there are also claw tentacles, which are melee, dealing high damage, and they also knock players up when they spawn, risking an eye beam bouncing around. Periodically, he will cast Dark Glare, where he will emit a giant red beam and rotate around the room, instantly killing any player caught in it. And once this ability ends, the raid must once more spread out in order to avoid chaining the I-beam. Yeah. So that's phase one, 
and once the eyeball <laughs> is killed, the next phase begins where he'll spawn an even bigger eye and claw tentacles, which similarly must be killed as soon as possible. It's a very He cool takes 99% reduced damage during this phase until you make him vulnerable. Every once in a while, he'll swallow random players and they'll enter his stomach where there'll be some tentacles, which must all be killed before the stacking acid debuff becomes too much to heal. There's a spot to jump out, so usually it takes a few rotations in order to kill these tentacles without yeah, sacrificing any players. Too, too if successful, he'll become vulnerable to damage for a short period, and then it's rinse and repeat until he's dead. So all of this proved to be quite the challenge for players, but in his initial release, the amount of damage that the adds did and how often they spawned was just too much, and despite months of trying, not huh? a single guild was able to overcome it until he received a pretty hefty nerf. Okay, the last boss he's gonna mention. Let's go through them. Like, like I don't remember, obviously, like, lo like, lore back in the day. Like, oh my god, this boss was impossible until it got patched. But, let me see. He's mentioned most difficult bosses so far. The ones that are like on top of my mind is I mean Vistus is one. Like Vistus is beyond any any other boss out there. It's literally unkillable if you don't have certain items. So Vistus could be one of them. And I could also see it from way back then how people would be like, wait, whoa, what the fuck? How are we even supposed to kill this? Like, yeah, you know what? Uh, frost ones, frost spells, and frost weapons from like, bla um, what the hell was that? Uh, level forty instance. I can't remember the, the the name of the instance, but like, so that's one. That's one. Visitus is definitely, definitely the odd one out there. I I could definitely see Visitus being the number one. Other than that, <sighs> Patchwork Resuvius. Fire Maw. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead with Visitus. Whoa. Huh? Really? So, you're wondering what could be harder than that? Well, how about a boss that went unkilled for all of vanilla, nerfs or no? Well, a hard mode version of the boss at least. The number one hardest boss in our list is the final of the Zulker upgrade, Hakar Five Priest. So he comes with- What? Unkillable throughout vanilla. A special challenge. Unlike other raids, you could just go straight to him from the entrance and fight him, but it came with a catch. The raid holds 10 bosses total, five of them being priests. And for each priest that's up, he gains 50,000 life, as well as a variety of unique abilities specific to each priest. The bad priest gives him AoE damage, as well as an 8 second silent. Spider gives him a 6 second stun to the tank, as well as resetting aggro. Tiger gives him a 150% attack speed increase. And the panther gives him gouge, which resets aggro. And the snake priest made it so corrupted blood, which was an important mechanic for the fight, deal poison damage to the raid. And all of this was added onto the normal fight, which worked like this. The main mechanic of the fight is Blood Siphon, where he'll stun the entire raid and drain their life, damaging the players and healing him, unless the player is afflicted with the Corrupted Blood debuff. To get this, you have to pull and kill the infinitely spawning Sons of Hakar down the stairs, and stand in a pool that they leave behind shortly before the Siphon begins. Aside from that, he will mind control his highest threat, making it a two tank fight with the mind controlled requiring crowd control until it wore off. Uh -huh. So the fight at its base wasn't the worst, but with these priests at the time, I it mean, was impossible. Yeah. Although one guild did get close. The same guild mentioned earlier, Elitist Jerks managed to get him down to 2% with all five priests sub just days before the 2.0 pre-patch that came with the Burning Crusade expansion. But that was the closest that anyone ever got. Today, raiding in vanilla is kind of laughed at, as far as difficulty is concerned, yeah. it's pretty trivial. Yeah, it's, I mean, stand. I, it's outdated, obviously. Like, it, the, the, the mechanics were made from 2005 or 4 or 5. Obviously. It's more, way more complex now. These raids are cleared in record time, and the difficulty has more shifted towards self-imposed challenges, such as parsing and speedrunning. 
Today, many guilds have cleared five priests to car, but like I said, pretty much, 2004 yeah. to 2007 culture, although the game was mostly the same, the community was very different. There was no DBM, no nicely edited guides on YouTube to having your second monitor, or these really helpful database websites, and obviously nearly two decades of experience with the game. There's no doubt, the community has mastered it, but during their time, it was another story. I mean, there's a reason why Nextrimus was re-released in the game's second expansion, Wrath. It was because so few people had even seen the raid in its entirety. <laughs> Today, with That's the addition funny. of LFR mode and the toughest challenges being funneled into heroic and mythic difficulty, raiding is more accessible than ever before. But yeah. This was a luxury that only started in Wrath. Before then, if you couldn't kill a boss, you just couldn't kill it. There was no easier option. Yeah, go play another game. <laughs> You couldn't look it up on YouTube because YouTube didn't exist. The most they had was Warcraft maybe, movies, uh. I suppose. I think the fact that there's no easier difficulty to run to should also be a pretty heavy consideration when discussing the difficulty of raid bosses. But whatever the case may be, I hope you enjoyed my video. I'm sure you guys have a different order of this, or maybe you have different bosses entirely. I'd like to see them, so let me know. But aside from that, like the video if you liked it, because I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Yeah, pretty good video. Um, and I like that he does. I mean, I mean, uh, don't take it for me because I don't put much effort and time into editing videos or researching or writing scripts. But Mad Season does a really good, and in a sense of like, I wrote it. I when when I did the videos, I did it in my own experience, in two thousand nineteen, but. He takes research and looks up stuff from how it was back then before things were even patched. That takes more effort. Um, that just hats off to you, dude, for making really good content. Like, always appreciate uh, Mad Season, 100%.